Well, good morning. Over the course of the last couple of months, uh, we've heard a lot of talk about money and the economy, the amount of wealth that's been lost, the amount of wealth that's been distributed through stimulus packages, trillions of dollars, a number that most of us can't even fathom, have been spent and lost as we've struggled with the economic impact of the coronavirus and the subsequent lockdowns and shutdowns of economies all over the country and all over the world. And it's raised a question of how we interact with wealth and the place that it has in our lives. And so as we continue to explore Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, our author, also sees the reality of wealth under the sun. And today our passage focuses directly on that topic and the place that wealth has in our lives. As we begin today's message, there are some key words that are going to recur throughout the passage and that help orient us to Kohelet's meaning. The first is the word to see. Kohelet will say this word several times in terms of things that he sees under the sun, but he's also going to use it in a unique way of seeing good. And so we're going to encounter that concept, what it means to see good in the world around us. Second word is another word that we've encountered already, which is the word toil. And toil is a word Kohelet uses to mean purposeless work, work that is to no advantage. It's not the sort of work that leads to a sense of accomplishment and purpose. It's mundane, trivial, and meaningless work. Toil is what he sees under the sun. The third, and one that is now unique to this passage, is the word to eat and the accompanying word appetite, which is sometimes translated as soul, the deep, deep desires that human beings have. And eating is not just the literal eating of food, but the consumption of goods and resources, and it occurs frequently in our passage today. A fourth and unique term for this passage is a term that can be translated sickening. In most English translations, it's rendered grievous, but it's attached to the word evil. It's something, a negative circumstance that's not just negative or unpleasant. He envisions it as causing a disease, a sickening of our souls. So we're going to encounter sickening evil. And then finally, the terms evil and good are going to show up repeatedly as Kohelet explores wealth and asks whether it is ultimately for evil or good. And so as we begin in our passage today, we're going to start with some verses we looked at last week. Ecclesiastes 4, 4 through 6. And I saw all the toil and all the skilled deeds, that it is a man's envy of his fellow. This too is mere breath and hurting the wind. The fool hugs his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is one handful with quiet than two handfuls with toil and hurting the wind. Kohelet here says that wealth ultimately is a matter of competition and strife between people, that everyone's fighting for their biggest share of the pie. And so all of our toil, all of our work is about trying to get as much of the resources as we can. Some people, meanwhile, choose a path that Kohelet and the Proverbs identify as foolish, a path of laziness, and the result is that they eat their own flesh in Kohelet's words. They result in their own destruction and their poverty. And so Kohelet seems to strike a middle ground here, saying it's better to be content with one handful and find rest and quiet than it is to have two handfuls and a striving after the wind, a meaninglessness. As Kohelet continues to consider the way that our societies operate with wealth, the last passage we looked at last week, Ecclesiastes 5, 8, and 9, says this, If you see in a province the oppression of the poor, the violation of right and justice, do not be surprised by the affair. For over one official, another official keeps watch, and still over them are officials. An advantage for a country in every way is this, a king for the tilled land. And so Kohelet identifies that we have systematized the competition for wealth and resources, a hierarchy of officials, power brokers, those that are in control of the wealth. And he 
indicates here that even a king can't undo that. The king can simply manage that system, oftentimes being part of it in corruption and oppression, oftentimes just trying to restrain it, but that we all live within this system where there is constant competition and war fought over wealth and goods and resources. And so Kohelet now begins to consider, is it worth it? Is all of this struggle and strife really worth it? And he looks at two things that we often think wealth brings us. The first is security, and the second is satisfaction. And Kohelet's conclusion will be that wealth brings us neither security nor satisfaction. And so as we continue in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10, Kohelet says this, Whoever loves money never has enough of it, nor the lover of wealth enough income. This too is mere breath. When goods increase, those who eat them increase. What gain has the owner except something for his eyes to look upon? Sweet is the worker's sleep, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich allows no sleep. Kohelet begins by introducing the idea of satisfaction, and he'll come back to that. But he begins to talk about the reality that as we accrue more resources, we end up supplying them to others. And so wealthy people will have more people coming to them, either their employees or people with their hands out, and their wealth ends up going to others. They don't keep most of it for themselves. The owners of large companies are in fact distributing their wealth to their employees. And so Kohelet says, what is it that they're striving after? There's only so much that one person can consume on their own. Or is this all just meaningless toil? And then Kohelet compares the worker, or literally in Kohelet's context, a slave, and says the slave has pleasant sleep because of the minimal resources that they have where the rich person is often deprived of sleep by the pressures and anxieties of all of that wealth that they have. And we might hear pause and say, time out. Easy for Kohelet to say, cry me a river of tears into a bag of money. How can the rich person complain about their wealth? I'd love to have those problems. Kohelet's not unaware of that and is not naive, although he probably represents a wealthy person himself and doesn't have experience as one in poverty. But he goes on to say that wealth's security that we might long for is an illusion. In verse 13, he says, there is a sickening evil I have seen under the sun, riches kept by their owner to their hurt. Namely, the riches are lost in a bad business. Then he begets a son with nothing in his hand. Just as he came forth from his mother's womb, naked will he again go as he came, and nothing for his toil will he have in his hand to take with him. This is a sickening evil. As he came, so must he go. Then what profit does he have from his toiling for the wind? All his days, too, he eats in darkness with much worry and sickness and rage. Kohelet here makes it very clear that wealth as we accrue it comes with baggage. It comes with complications. It comes with burdens. Wealth does not solve the problem of our vulnerabilities and weaknesses as human beings. Because even if we have it, we spend so much time worrying over it and administering it that it doesn't bring peace to our lives. And there's no guarantee that we will keep our wealth. Our businesses can go bad so quickly as we have seen in these last days. So the first question that I have for us this morning is where do we find security? I know for myself, it is easy to look at my bank account and feel a certain sense of security. I've got this much, I can get through some sort of crisis. And to feel less secure when that number shrinks and more secure when that number grows. And Kohelet cautions us that wealth does not offer that kind of security. And so it's worth asking, where do you find security?
So we've seen that Kohelet has explored the question of wealth and whether it can offer us security in an uncertain world. What drives our competition, our striving to accrue as much as we can, is often a sense that we want to be safe and secure, and wealth seems to offer that. And Kohelet has said, no, it doesn't. But we said at the beginning that Kohelet also will ask the question whether wealth can satisfy us, because oftentimes our pursuit of wealth is about the satisfaction of our various appetites. And those words are going to continue to occur. We already saw that Kohelet mentions that when wealth is accrued by one person, the people who eat it, the people who consume it, also multiply. And so Kohelet continues in verse 18 and turns his attention to something good. Look, I have seen what is good and fitting. It is to eat and to drink and to see good in all his toil in which he toils under the sun in the number of the days of his life that God gave him. For that is his portion. Also, anyone to whom God gives riches and possessions and the power to eat of them, to have his portion and to rejoice in his toil, this is a gift of God. Indeed, he will hardly be concerned with the days of his life because God makes him busy with his heart's delight. Kohelet often engages in very subtle ways of making his point. So here it may seem that he's contradicting himself. He's just talked about all the trouble that wealth brings. And now he says, but here's what is good. Here's what is fitting and appropriate under the sun in God's world. And it is to eat and to drink, to actually see good. It's a phrase that is translated to enjoy in some of our English translations, but it's literally to see good in our toil, in the very thing that Kohelet has identified as purposeless, meaningless work. He now says, what is good and what is fitting is to eat and to drink and to see good in all our toil under the sun. And that to the extent that we do this, that when God grants us wealth and possessions and the power to eat of them, that we will never be dismayed or frustrated, burdened by the troubles of this life because God will keep us busy with the delight of our hearts. It sounds different than what Kohelet has been saying throughout this passage and throughout the book to this point, but it's a theme that he repeats over and over again, that what is good under the sun is to eat and drink and enjoy what we can. And part of us feels like that's also something that goes a little bit against the rest of Scripture. We're encouraged to deny worldly pleasures and to avoid falling into those patterns of, of self-gratification. And so what is it that Kohelet is trying to say here? Is he contradicting himself? Is he contradicting the message of the rest of Scripture? And as I've looked at this passage and looked at Kohelet's view of things, the word to see is really important. And it becomes clear in what Kohelet now begins to say. He begins to contrast this way of approaching life under the sun, of approaching wealth, with its opposite. And so as we continue in chapter 6, listen carefully to what Kohelet says. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, and it is heavy on humankind. A man whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor, and he lacks nothing for his appetite of all that he desires. But God has not given him the power to eat of them. Instead, a stranger will eat them. This is mere breath and a sickening evil. If a man begot a hundred children and lived many years, and many were the days of his life, but his appetite is not satisfied with good things, then even without a burial, I say the stillborn is better off than he. For though in mere breath did it come, and into darkness it goes, and in darkness its name is covered, though it sees not the sun nor knows anything, it has more quiet than he. And were he to live a thousand years twice over, yet saw no good, does not everything go to a single place? All a man's toil is for his own mouth, yet his appetite will not be filled. For what advantage has the wise over the fool? What advantage has a poor person who knows how to cope with life? Better is it that the eyes see than that the appetite wanders. This too is mere breath, and hurting the wind. Kohelet's made some very strong statements in this passage, but he continues this 
scenario of considering an incredibly wealthy person, a person so wealthy that they have everything their appetite desires. The word for appetite there is also sometimes translated soul. It means that everything that the deepest desires of a human being have is satisfied. This person's wish has become their command. There's nothing that they deny themselves. And here it's important to note that especially in Kohelet's context, but as he's identified also the patterns of the way the world is, that all of our toil for wealth comes at the expense of our neighbors, it's our envy and greed that drives us in this way, that this man has amassed all of this wealth on the backs of an oppressive hierarchical system where people are enslaved or indentured servants. And so this is not simply a merit-based economy that this person has acquired wealth in. And in reality, there's no such thing as a purely merit-based economy under the sun. Human beings have consistently built systems where someone is worse off than they deserve to be and someone is better off than they deserve to be. And so we need to recognize that. And Kohelet says that imagine this person who, however they've come by it, has amassed all of this wealth. They're not going to find satisfaction. And the way that he says this is that their appetite will be filled, but they'll see no good, and so they'll have no power to eat of it. They won't be able to actually see good in it. I think the, the point that Kohelet is making here is that joy is a choice. That joy is a choice that is not based on the amount of wealth that we possess. See, what Kohelet is striking at here is our assumption that the problem of happiness in the world is found in the amount of resources that one person has. The idea that I would be content if I just had a little bit more. And Kohelet imagines this person of fabulous wealth and says even for them, it still would take a little bit more to make them happy, to bring them contentment because they see no good in it. And so revisiting what Kohelet said at the end of chapter 5, he sees what is good and fitting, and it is to eat and to drink and to see good in our toil. Because he makes this stark statement that for this person who has fabulous wealth and yet sees no good, that they are worse off than a stillborn child. Now that is a drastic statement. Kohelet seems to be saying, that stillborn children are better off than anyone else. I don't think he means that literally, and it's certainly not true. And if understood that way, would be an incredibly calloused statement to make. But what Kohelet is saying is that there is good to be seen under the sun if we choose to see it. And this is where Kohelet's robust and stubborn faith comes into view, even though it can be obscured at times, as we talked about last week. Kohelet looks at a world in which there is inequity and injustice, where the poor are oppressed, where wealth is amassed through greed and unjust competition, and says, and yet there is good to be seen. Even though in his view we all go to the same place, he has no concrete hope of something beyond the grave, he says the only thing that we can be sure of is that God, who is good, created and gave us everything we see. And we can choose to see the good gifts of God's hand and receive them rather than striving to take what we see. The basic posture is one of taking versus one of receiving. And so Kohelet's conclusion is that it is better for the eye to see. It is better for us to look on the world and see the good things God has given to us, whatever they are, rather than for our appetites to wander continuously in discontent, striving after wealth that brings neither security nor satisfaction. So the second question that I would ask us is where do we find satisfaction? Kohelet again is stubbornly refusing to believe that there's only evil under the sun. There is good and he insists that we see it. But we know the message of Scripture doesn't stop here, and so I want to invite you as well to continue the conversation. Below the video clip of this message, there's a resource, Digging Deeper, and it points to two New Testament passages that I believe draw directly on Kohelet's teaching in the verses we've considered today, words of Jesus and words of Paul, that I think help 
further our understanding of how we engage with our wealth under the sun and find both security and satisfaction in the right places.